These are the scariest stories ever told on the internet. Throughout my entire life, my parents have always left the TV on static at night. We are demanded that we leave no devices running in the living room and that we never go into the living room from the times 1am to 6am. When me and my sister were kids and very curious, our parents had to give us sleeping pills to keep us asleep so we didn't go down. They put alarms in case we were near the stairs at night. Alarms that were loud enough to wake my parents up, but not loud enough for anyone else in the other rooms to hear. Some days they would complain about the electricity bills being high. Me and my sister would just ask them to leave the TV off to save electricity, but they never listened and said it was mandatory. Me and my sister, my sister's name is Megan. She is 18 and I am Christopher, I am 16. We were going to be left home alone for a week while my parents were on vacation. Every night while my parents were gone, my sister had the responsibility of leaving the TV on. On the third day of my parents being gone, I left my Alexa plugged into the wall and it was still running. Normally, my parents would check the living room before heading to bed. Since Megan had already turned the static on and went to bed, there was no one to turn the Alexa off. I went to bed and was woken up at 2.47 am to loud smashing. I got up and went to the stairs to go down and see what the commotion was. My sister grabbed me by the arm and she was already standing crouched by the hallway beside the stairs. Don't go down, she said quietly. Remember what mom and dad told us? We can never go down the stairs under any circumstances. I told her it didn't matter and this was urgent, but no matter how much I wanted to, she wouldn't let me. Around 20 minutes later, the sound stopped and my sister went to her room and laid there awake. I, on the other hand, pretended to go back to sleep, but snuck by and went down the stairs. I checked my phone on the way. It was 3.37 am. I crouched near the door and peeked into the living room. I saw a black figure. I would say it was around 7 feet tall. No hands or any facial features. Just a pitch black creature staring into the static. My first assumption was that the static was to keep the creature at bay. My Alexa was smashed to bits. I was about to go upstairs and get my sister and I out of the house, but then at that moment my phone buzzed. A YouTube notification popped up and my phone made noise. The creature heard me. My daughter Kennedy is 13 years old, but she thinks like a wise grandma. She never causes any trouble and knows what's best for herself. She never needed help with anything and she only relied on herself. It started to get really bad when she turned 10. Me and my wife Lauren thought it was cute when she wanted to do everything on her own, but it got out of hand when she would totally break down if we tried to help her. She never asked us for any help with school, never asked my wife for advice for boys like most preteens would. We got so worried when she stopped eating and lost 10 pounds because of how focused she was on school. Kennedy was our first kid at the time, so we had to ask around on how we can help her. The local parents had some basic ideas like going on vacation or having a family game night every Friday. Me and my wife had already thought of these, but it never worked out in the end. Kennedy always found a way to think of school and work. We kept on asking the parents when one couple said, take her on a camping trip. Me and Lauren really thought about this idea. It would be a secluded cabin by a nice lake. It would be a perfect opportunity to have some family time without anything in our way. Little did we know that would be the worst mistake of our lives. On June 28, 2013, at 9.45 a.m., we left for the cabin. Lauren's parents used to camp all the time before they died, so they left the cabin for her. Lauren was excited because she hadn't been there since she was 17. I remember the whole way there, it's hard to forget a day like that. The weather was great, the sky was blue, and the wind was just right. We had a little party in the car, but of course, Kennedy didn't want to join in. When we got closer to the cabin, the smooth road became gravel. When we got there, Kennedy immediately got out of the car and ran down to the lake. It was weird because Kennedy hated lakes because of how they were infested with bacteria and diseases. Me and Lauren unpacked the car while Kennedy sat down in front of the lake. This is going to be a lot better than we planned, Lauren said, placing down her suitcase in the cabin. I know, I think this was a good idea. I said as I was placing down the last of our bags. Lauren brought her stuff upstairs to our room while I took a look around. I've never been to this cabin before, so all of this was new to me. After an hour or two, Kennedy still didn't come inside. Me and Lauren didn't bother to bring her in before 
because she looked like she really liked the outside, but it was getting dark, so I went outside while Lauren was cooking some hamburgers. Kennedy, I yelled a little bit. Dinner's almost ready, so come back inside. No answer. Kennedy? I yell a little louder than last time. Boo! <laughs> Kennedy comes up from behind me and scares the living shit out of me. Oh my gosh, Kennedy. Don't scare me like that. I'm holding my heart through my shirt. Kennedy <laughs> grins and walks inside. Kennedy was way mature than this, but I brushed it off because maybe she felt more at ease out here. We had our hamburgers and went upstairs to go to sleep. Kennedy was happier and energetic, which is the total opposite from what she is at home. At home, Kennedy is sad and gloomy and so, so tired. When Lauren finished brushing her teeth, I told her what happened when I was calling in Kennedy from outside and of course she just said it's because of the change of scenery, but I had a bad feeling in my gut, but I was tired to think much of it, so I fell asleep. I was first up, so decided to make breakfast for a change. I finished cooking some pancakes and went upstairs to wake up the girls. I went into mine and Lauren's room and she was sleeping so peacefully. I gently shook her to wake her up. Rise and shine, breakfast is ready. Lauren smiled a bit and got up. I was on my way to Kennedy's room when a wave of rotten stench <coughs> took over. I almost <coughs> threw up on the spot, but I had to swallow it back. I slowly walked up to Kennedy's door and opened it. Her window was open and there was a dead deer laying on the side of her bed. The deer was in shreds. The inside was on the outside. Its eyeballs were nowhere to be seen and there were bugs all inside and out. I looked around and Kennedy was gone. I yelled for Lauren, telling her that Kennedy is missing. Lauren ran to Kennedy's room and held back a mouthful of vomit. She ran back to our room and quickly called 911. It took them 25 minutes to get to the cabin because we were literally in the middle of nowhere. They searched around the cabin and a little in the woods, but found nothing but a piece of clothing that Kennedy had on. We had to leave our things back at the cabin so that the detectives could do a search. Me and Lauren got asked questions like, what were you doing when she went missing? And stuff like, did she act differently beforehand? You know, like what they ask on TV. We soon got released and went back home. Lauren fell ill a couple days after the disappearance, so I had to take more days off of work so I could take care of her. Lauren didn't eat and had many nightmares about Kennedy and the dead deer in her room. I got her into therapy two weeks after Kennedy went missing. I was worried about Lauren and the things she could do to herself. Lauren was progressively getting better after every session and so she started eating more in result. We were having chicken alfredo that night when we got a knock at the door. It was a soft knock that could have been mistaken for wind. At first, that's what we thought, so we continued eating until the soft knock turned into a bang. We both jumped and stared at the door for a good minute, then I got up to check the door. I opened the door slowly, and then I saw her, Kennedy standing on the front steps. She smelled disgusting and looked like she's been to hell and back. I quickly let her inside, and Lauren ran to her while sobbing on Kennedy's shoulder while squeezing her in a tight hug. I quickly called the ambulance and gave her a tight hug despite her smelling like a dead animal. When we got to the hospital, there were doctors outside already waiting for her with a stretcher. Kennedy was rushed inside while me and Lauren waited in the waiting room. It took about 25 minutes before a nurse came out and led us into her room. She didn't say anything while we were there. Even when the police came in and questioned her, she was silent. She was allowed out the next day because her cuts weren't that bad. On the way home, I took a quick peek at the rear view mirror to check up on Kennedy and found her already looking at me, no emotion in her eyes. I got startled and quickly looked away. When we got home, she immediately went up to her room and slammed the door so loud it made me jump. Me and Lauren were worried when she didn't come down for dinner. It was finally time for bed when I heard a thump come from her room. Me and Lauren rushed to her room and was shocked by what we saw. A tall, dark man holding a dead deer over his shoulder. I quickly turned around looking for the light switch and when I looked back, the man was gone. The only thing left was the deer. It looked identical from the deer at the cabin. I hadn't seen Mike in a few months. He'd been buried in work and our usual weekend nights out had disappeared. When he called me on a Thursday and invited me over for drinks, I jumped at the invite, but took note of how depressed he sounded on the phone. By the time I got there, Mike had already started drinking and was slurring his words. A dark cloud seemed to hover over him, which got worse as we drank. I finally asked what been going on with him. Mike turned darker, afraid. He said it had to do with work. 
I never really knew what Mike did for a living. I did know he worked for the city in the tech department and was involved with the CCTV surveillance network, but I never knew what his day-to-day -day operations were which he began to describe in detail. Mike explained that there were thousands of cameras scattered throughout the downtown core, outlying neighborhoods and well into the suburbs of our 1 million plus city. His responsibility was to categorize and archive all of the incoming footage. Most of the footage went into very general classifications and were saved in hard drive farms and identified with a lengthy combination of numbers and letters for categorical archiving. They were truly meant to be forgotten about. It was an expansive task, but Mike designed and built an AI screening program that detected common patterns in footage, then sectioned out anomalous behavior for review. The vast majority wasn't noteworthy, something like 99.99%. Then there was that 0.01%, the car accidents, assaults, swarmings, abductions, murders, those went into a special archive for use in criminal investigations. Then there was the 0.0001%. They were held in a classified archive and contained footage capturing events that for all accounts were unexplainable. This was called the Tartarus Archive. I looked up the word Tartarus after and discovered it was one of the darkest, deepest prisons from Greek mythology. It was said that if you dropped an anvil from heaven, it would take seven days for it to reach the earth. It would take another seven days for the anvil to reach Tartarus. It was the place you sent titans when there was nowhere else that could contain them. As it turned out, the name was quite fitting to the archive's growing content. Some footage could be simplified to strange optical anomalies in the footage and coincidences of light or crackheads on a bender through the subway systems. Other footage, though, defied logic. The others are what captured Mike's mind that evening. He'd been breaking protocol and bringing hard drives home at night. In fact, he'd been splicing the footage together, capturing and compiling repeat aberrations and editing them into linear sequences. Mike wanted to show me. It wasn't in a bragging or showing off kind of way. It felt more like the sharing of a heavy burden kind of way. I asked if showing me would get him in trouble, but he waved the idea away. I said, obviously, I, I want to see what's going on in this city. Mike led me into his workroom where he had monitors and towers and piles of externals set up. We sat down and he skimmed through some drives nervously. Then he landed on one. Mike told me this anomaly was codenamed Lincoln Scepter. He pressed play. On the largest screen, black and white footage started up, showing Lincoln Avenue, one of our less attractive downtown streets, at 3 a.m. The camera angle showed the length of Lincoln Avenue as it led into the downtown core. The street appeared empty and quiet. From a side road, a woman emerged, walking towards the camera. As she approached the intersection, she turned over her shoulder and appeared to scream. The woman took off, sprinting past the camera, which cut to a new, wider angle from another camera across the street. We watched the woman running frantically, seemingly being chased, but she was the only one on the street. There was no one else anywhere around her. The woman kept screaming as she ran and the cameras kept following, cutting between different CCTV angles. We watched as the woman was chased into the middle of an empty intersection. She fell, then cowered as if something massive was standing over her. The woman's neck stiffened, and she began to levitate off the ground. Her body looked like a rag doll as something lifted her by the throat until she was floating, a dozen feet above the road, in the middle of the intersection. Then, the woman's head snapped to the left, and her body fell to the ground. The video ended, and it went black. I sat, shocked. Mike saw my expression and said, You ain't seen nothing yet. I asked if it was real, if what I saw was unaltered, was raw footage. Mike said all he'd done was put the clips together. None of the content had been touched. He told me he found out the incident ended up being described as a hit and run, and the case was left figuratively open for more evidence to amass, which it never would. The department kept the footage hidden, claiming it was camera malfunction. No one outside of Mike and his boss had seen the video of how the poor woman actually died. I started to understand the air of somberness Mike was carrying around. Mike started the next video. This one was codenamed Black Crab and was much longer than the previous one. It started in the subway systems at the underground Walkie station, shortly after closing up for the night. Walkley was the last stop on the route, 
and the exterior was shrouded by a new housing development on one side and untouched forest and swampland on the other. The camera was pointed down along the subway platform on the east side and showed its entire length with benches and garbage cans populating it. At the far end, the tunnel was filled with darkness. The lights on the platform shut off and the station went dark. The camera switched to night vision and everything became visible again. My eyes trained on the platform, waiting for something to happen. Finally, there was movement. It was coming from the tunnel. It was difficult to identify what exactly it was at first, as its movements were strange and the footage was grainy. But it got closer to the camera and I got a better look. It resembled a human. A man. But he was walking on his hands and feet, upside down, with his back arched and his stomach pointed to the ceiling. He had long, dark hair that dragged along the ground, and he wore tattered layers of old jackets and torn pants. He moved like a crab, jerkily yet quickly and easily as he made his way down to the staircase. The footage cut to a new camera in the dark hallway leading to the stairs of out of the station. We watched the crab walker claw up two steps at a time and then crawl over the turnstiles and towards the exit. The footage cut again, now showing the exterior of the station entrance. The crab walker squeezed and twisted and maneuvered his body through the locked and closed entrance gate. It looked impossible to accomplish but he did it. Once outside, the crab walker eyed his surroundings before skittering off towards the woods and disappearing. The footage cut to an hour later and revealed the crab walker reappearing from the woods. He was dragging a small animal by the tail in his teeth. The animal looked like a cat. The crab walker squeezed back through the gate, crawled through the station, and disappeared into the subway tunnel. Again, Mike saw my expression and told me there was more. He showed me the length of the video, which was over an hour long. Mike had compiled over 20 sequences of the crab walker creeping out of the subway station and into the woods. Mike skimmed through the video towards the end, and we watched the crab walker come out of the sewer in a downtown alleyway. It crawled over to a pile of garbage bags and cardboard boxes. Then it jumped into them, and some kind of vicious frenzy ensued. There was something else in the pile of garbage. Hands and feet thrashed about as they were struggling for their life. Then the movement stopped, and the hands and feet went still. The crab walker's body moved jerkily about, but I couldn't see what was happening because of the darkness and all the garbage bags and boxes obscuring the camera's view. Mike leaned over to me and whispered that the crab walker was eating a homeless man. This caused a criminal investigation as the dead body was found mutilated and festering in the open alleyway. Mike followed up on the inquiry. What he discovered was the crab walker was who authorities believed to be a man named David Fletcher. Decades ago, David had been a prominent lawyer with a family. One Christmas, there was a house fire and his wife and kids were killed in the blaze. It was David's fault. He lost everything, including his mind. Everything has a breaking point, whether they know it or not. A place where they bend too far and then snap. David found this. Family and friends described his descent as nightmarish. David lived on the streets, became addicted to drugs, and tumbled into mental illness. The last anyone knew of him was from 10 years prior. He'd thrown himself in front of a subway at the Walkie station, and no one heard from or saw him again. It appeared that somehow, David had survived the subway hit. His back had broken and healed strangely, causing him to move the way he did. He'd adapted to the new posture and lived in the darkness of the subway tunnels, drinking water from drains and eating wild animals that he had caught. That was what Mike found out, at least. But then he said, that was just the answer the investigators gave in discovery. Who knows where the truth lay? Mike said there was always an answer for the videos he saw. Whether the answers were true or not, no one knew. But the ones that had to become public all needed explanations, however absurd. Either way, David was never found and didn't reappear on the subway footage. Mike plugged a new hard drive in. He poured a fresh drink and told me this was the one that was troubling him. The file was codenamed Cloud Mirror. I wasn't sure I wanted to see it, but before I could object, Mike pressed play. All of the monitors lit up with footage from different intersections downtown, on the exact date and time as each other. There were five in total. The streets on each screen were empty and quiet, no cars or people. Suddenly, at the exact same time in the center of the intersections, a small glow pulsed into existence. It was some kind of orb, roughly the size of a bowling ball. The streetlights around it pulsed with energy waves as the orb grew larger. It grew to the size of a beach ball. Then it flashed out, 
The streetlights went back to normal and the intersection was as lifeless as it was before. I asked Mike what they were. He told me he had gigabytes of footage of the orbs and had watched them repeatedly. He didn't know what they were, at first. Then they started to change. Mike clicked onto the next video. Again, the five monitors lit up with the same intersections and time of night, but several weeks later. The streetlights glowed and pulsed and an orb manifested into existence again. It grew to its beach ball size, but then altered its surface and glow. Something gas-like replaced it, growing outward into a couch-sized cloud of dark gray. One of the cameras was closer, so I got to see the small clouds in detail. It looked like a volcanic eruption wrapping around itself. They were large, constantly morphing blobs that curled outward from a glowing center, resembling a mandel bulb fractal as a gaseous-based organism. It was fascinating to see them floating in the middle of the street, so alien to our roads and stoplights and street lamps. Then they began to move, gliding down empty roads. The cameras cut to different angles, following the clouds on an unknown path, zigging and zagging onto new streets and through alleyways. Then they'd stop. The clouds hovered in the center of their intersection. They lowered a ground level, standing straight up like a large coffin. Holding rigid to the shape, their exteriors continued to shift and mold together like magnets made of smoke. Something on one of the monitors caught my eye. Down the street, people appeared. They'd seen the cloud and were walking towards it. The group looked drunk and fascinated by the floating entity. So much so, they were approaching it. As they did, the cloud became brighter. The street lamps around it pulsed. The group were in some kind of trance, staring into the morphing blob. One of the group, a guy stared into it like a zombie, then walked right into the cloud and disappeared. None of the group tried to stop him. Instead, another one followed him in, and another, and another. All five members of the group disappeared into the cloud. Each monitor showed the same thing now. People entering the clouds and coming back out, different. Mike stopped the video. I asked him if he'd shown this to anyone else. He said he hadn't. Not even to his boss. It was a problem, because he had a meeting with his boss in the morning to discuss the missing footage. I asked why he didn't show the footage to his boss. This footage seemed more than serious. People were being replaced by something. Mike sighed and put a new video on. The main monitor lit up and showed a new downtown street. The date was from earlier this week. One of the clouds was floating in the intersection. A middle-aged couple were walking nearby, the husband with a slight limp in his right leg. The couple saw the cloud and were sucked in by its aura. They approached it, eyes wide and mouths open. Both the husband and wife entered the cloud and disappeared. After a moment, they reappeared. The husband's limp was gone. Mike turned to me and said, that was my boss and his wife.